there was a young Sunday school class that was being taught by this very creative <coughs> art teacher and she thought one of the best ways to get her young children to understand what happened on Christmas was to get them to draw it for them. And so after reading the Christmas story to them, she gave them each a piece of paper and crayons and pens and markers and uh, put them at their tables and told them to draw what they thought the Christmas nativity must have looked like. And so they all did, and then at the end they turned their, their drawings in and she got them all in and she looked at them and she thought how wonderful these kids all understood it and she got to little Johnny's and she held up and looked at little Johnny's and Johnny was quite the artist he he had done a great job it was you know whereas a lot of kids had drawn stick figures and uh, that sort of thing you know some of them had the wise men some of them had the shepherds some you couldn't tell the difference between the cows and the sheep but little Johnny's was actually quite good and he had Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the lambs and everything. And right beside the manger, he had drawn this very chubby little boy. And the teacher said, well, you know, Johnny, I, I know who Mary and Joseph are. I can see that in your picture. And I can see baby Jesus in the manger. I see the shepherds. And I can see all the animals that you've driven and that you've drawn. And it's really quite good, but I, I have to ask you, who is the chubby little boy that you've got kneeling beside the manger? And he said, well, that's Round John Virgin. Round John Virgin. <laughs> that John Virgin. He just shows up all kinds of places. Round John Virgin. You know, for many people, especially those who work in retail, and my hats are off to you, I was there for many yes. years. I can almost hear this audible sigh of relief that Christmas is, is behind you. <coughs> I can tell you right now, the front row here is saying, I made it through another Christmas season and I've come out on the other side alive. <laughs> you know, it won't be long before we're driving down the street and we see all these dried up trees with bits of tinsel and icicle laying on the side of the road waiting for the garbage man to pick them up. And I promise you that within another week, if you walk through any of the retail stores, not only will every vestige of Christmas be gone, but they'll already have hearts and lace and red stuff up announcing Valentine's Day. <laughs> you know, we spend from basically Labor Day on rushing and planning skipping right through Halloween or Thanksgiving right into Christmas. We, we prepare and we plan and we decorate for Christmas Day. And then just in the blink of an eye, we toss it aside and we move on to the next thing that's listed in our day planner. But I think it's very important, especially for us as Christians, to understand that Christmas is not over yet. The celebration on Christmas Day is not the end of the story, it's the beginning of a story. Now, the world's version of Christmas may be over. Christmas out there in retail land or wherever else in non-Christian world may be over, but for us as Christians, Christmas is not just an event. It's not just one day, but Christmas is an invitation to a new life. If we allow Christmas to be over on December the 25th, and I think we're missing out on the promise and the fulfillment of a divine gift that's been offered to each and every one of us. And it's through the nurturing and growing of that gift that we've been given in our lives that we discover our identity as Christian people. In our New Testament lesson for today, Paul tells us who we are in light of what happened at the birth of our Savior. But he also tells us how we're to grow because Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. <coughs> I'd like you to listen 
to a short passage from the fourth chapter of Galatians. And I'm going to begin reading with the fourth verse and read through the seventh. And today I'm actually reading from the message because, as I've said before, I love to read Paul's letters from the message because it sounds so much like a letter that's being written. I invite you now to hear the Word of God from Galatians 4, beginning with verse 4. But when the time arrived that was set by God the Father, God sent His Son, born among us of a woman, born under the conditions of the law, so that He might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. Now hear that again. He was born under the conditions of the law so that he might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. Thus we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. You can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as his own children because God sent the spirit of his son into our lives crying out, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave, but a child? And if you are a child, you're also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. This is the reading of our New Testament lesson for today. This is the Word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks Thank be to God. In those short verses, I think what we can see is a progression that Paul points out to us about how our lives are to look through the lens of Christ's birth. You know, as Christians so often, and a lot of it has to do with the churches we grew up in or the denomination that, that we were raised in or how we were raised. As Christians, a lot of times we place so much more importance on one part of Christ's life than another. And, you know, there, there's a danger that we face with that because when we do that, when we say, well, you know, this part of Christ's life is more important than the other, we run the risk of doing ourselves a disservice because we're trying to decipher God's holy plan, God's divine plan, that none of us is capable of understanding or comprehending. You know, there are some folks out there that focus strictly on Christ's arrival to this earth. They say that's the most important thing, that's the most important event, that's the most important thing that happened in Christ's life. Now others say, no, those years, those three years he spent teaching the disciples, those three years that he spent developing the framework of the church, no, that's the most important part of Christ's story. And others move right to Calvary and the resurrection saying, this is more important than anything else that happened in the previous 33 years of Christ's life. For us to determine that any one of those aspects of Jesus' life is more important than the other is to forget that everything is in God's time and God's plan. You know, sometimes we, we try to put ourselves in God's shoes and we try to figure out what God is trying to do instead of just sitting back and saying, you know, God is not constrained by our time or our thoughts or our ideas. And so we, we need to sit back sometimes and say, this is God's plan, and this is God's timing, and we need to let, let it go at that. Perhaps one way to look at it is to consider Christ's life more like a three-act play instead of a series of short one-acts. You know, the first act sets the stage for all the action that's going to come. The third act brings the story to its conclusion. And the important second act bridges and develops the power and the purpose of what has happened already and what is going to happen in the end. Each act is equally important for the outcome of the play. If you take any one act out, the whole thing doesn't make sense. You have to have all three acts in order to understand what's going on. So right now we're concentrating a little bit on the first act of the play, the birth of Jesus Christ. And Paul shows us why in this letter that he wrote to the Galatians, why the birth of Christ is so important to us as Christians. In this short passage, those four verses that I read, he points out that in God's perfect timing, and he had, God waited until the exact right moment to send Jesus Christ to earth. 
you know, I've read a lot about why some people think uh, that Jesus came when he did, why it was a perfect time in God's plan. And it makes for interesting reading, but I would never try to put myself in the position of figuring out what God had in mind for this earth. But, you know, they say, well, it was time of the Pax Romana, which means there was worldwide peace. If the world was controlled by Rome. Rome had built roads. The uh, Jews had all been dispersed throughout the known world at that time so that the, the world was ripe for uh, evangelism once the, the message of Christianity got made. That, you know, they say all roads lead to Rome. Uh, the, there was a great road system. Commerce was, was going good. People were traveling. You know, there was no war. So, you know, some people think that that's the reason that it was the right time of, in God's plan to send Jesus. Like I said, it makes for interesting reading. I'll leave it up to you as to why you believe that uh, at the time that he sent him, that Jesus did come to this earth. But nonetheless, when he did come to this earth, Paul points out to us that in God's perfect timing, Jesus came to show us who we were, who we are, and who we are destined to become. In those four verses, if we look a little closer, I think you will see what I mean. Before Christ came to this earth, who were we? We were slaves. Not a lot of us like that term these days because it brings back a lot of negative memories and we don't really relate to it very well. We were enslaved <coughs> to the law. We were in bondage to the law. And because we could not keep the laws of God perfectly, we were always going to be in bondage to that law. No matter how good we tried to be, no matter how good we think we are, without the intervention of Jesus Christ in this world, we could never, ever stand in the presence of God. So, who were we? We were in bondage. When Jesus came, he said that he came to bring freedom to the oppressed. And what were we oppressed by? We were oppressed by the law. A law that none of us could keep. And you know, when he came, and he came to, to free the oppressed, who was he talking about? He was talking about all of us. Not just some of us. We have all been oppressed. As Paul wrote in Romans, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not one is righteous. So we've all been oppressed. We're all under bondage of, of the law. And as a result, without Jesus, we would be living in bondage and oppression still. When we take the opportunity to embrace God's great gift of love and life in Jesus Christ, when Christ truly becomes born again in our hearts, there's a serious rearranging of our life's priorities. We begin to think in a different way. When we commit to having our lives under the grace of Christ, it's only then that we come to realize just how oppressed we really were. Once we've gotten the freedom that we know through Christ Jesus, and we were just talking about that this morning in Sunday school, you know, we, we don't realize how much freedom we have until we look back and see how oppressed we were before Christ. Once we understand that freedom, that's only then when we can understand who we were. Paul goes on to write that because Jesus came into this world, who we were is not important. Our past is no longer important. Throw it away. Get rid of it. Don't think about it. Because he tells us that we're no longer slaves. We are now, because of Jesus Christ, children of God. <coughs> he tells us in today's version, thus we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. Now here's something amazing and wonderful about the birth of Christ. You know, usually when a baby is born or a child comes in to the world, it comes into a family. And it becomes a part of a family. When Christ was born, his birth created a family. 
Coming into this world, his birth created a family. The Gospel of John says that when Jesus came to earth, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave the power to become children of God. Now that's a wonderful promise for us. For anyone, anyone, no exclusions, anyone who accepts Jesus Christ becomes a child of God. Jesus Christ is God's gift to us, but when we receive that gift, we become a spiritual child of God. We're given to the one who gave himself for us. So we've now gone from who we were, bondage to God's law, to who we are, children of God, members of God's family, all because in God's perfect timing and God's perfect plan, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Paul finishes off his portion of the letter by telling us who we're destined to be. Verse 7 reminds us, if you are a child, you're also an heir. And as an heir, you have complete access to the inheritance. We are no longer slaves, but we are spiritual children of God. And as children of God, we are also heirs to the treasures that God has in store for us. One of the most wonderful truths about the gift of God is the joy of of living in Christ Jesus can never be taken away from us. It cannot be destroyed. It will not fade over time. The divine gift was given so that everyone who believes in Him should not perish, but will have everlasting life. In other words, the family of faith that was created when Christ was born, this family from which we receive our true identity and become who we are, this family that makes us free from the bondage of the law, this family from which we cannot be separated ever, even by death, is a gift of who we're destined to become. You know, we're going to constantly have physical death with us as a part of our lives during this lifetime of ours. There's just no escaping it. That's, that's just part of living in a fallen world. And for those who have lost a loved one, I know how hard Christmas is. I thought this past Christmas about my mom and my dad who are no longer with us. I know we talked with Jack about his wife and Sue not being here with us. And the rest of us who have lost loved ones, uh, you know, Christmas reminds us of just how fragile and finite we are as human beings. But you know, the wonderful thing is, even though grief visits us each and every day on this earth, one day the family of faith will be reunited. We'll see those that we love. The family of faith will endure forever. And that's a wonderful promise for those of us who have Christ Jesus in our hearts. My friends, the beauty of Christmas isn't found in one day or even a season but it's found throughout our entire lives. It's because of Christ's birth that we were able to be adopted into the family of God. We leave our past behind and we live in who we are now. We're children of God and heirs in eternity. Now while our redemption was accomplished on the cross at Calvary, the invitation came in the manger at Bethlehem. Christmas isn't over, not by a long shot. The birth of our Savior gives us joy. The joy that we need to move past our old lives and live abundantly in the new lives as children of God and heirs to eternity. Now, my friends, Christmas isn't over because it remains in our hearts as we move forward, as we grow in this new life as children of God and his brothers and sisters with Christ Jesus.